This is a quick TLDR. I'm basically going to say, oh, TLDR means too long, didn't read. I'm basically going to say that critical race theory, CRT, has become a very popular pedagogy in the world of teaching that defines the world as being uh, essentially Western hegemonic, Western supremacy. And the deconstructionism, the postmodern deconstruction um, tools enabling CRT have in fact filtered into the um, K through 12 teaching uh, pedagogy. And as a result, filter down to kids um, who are influenced by that pedagogy. For example, when I taught creative writing, my teacher slash mentor, uh, Ginny Little, uh, was really excited about whole language as a pedagogy. That influenced everything she did in the classroom. You don't need to teach CRT to students in the same way that you don't need to teach the classes that you took in your teaching school to the students. Those classes that you took in teacher's school, an education program, filter into your to your uh, class teachings. So to say CRT is not taught in schools is legalistically correct because there are no classes on how to teach K through 12 kids using uh, critical race theory as a, as a structure for history, literature, and civics. But it is part of the pedagogy itself, and that how it, how it influences uh, choosing of topics, choosing of, of, uh, of historical narratives, choices of literature, choices of philosophy, choices of, uh, of, of civics lessons, uh, and, and everything in between. So that is my opinion. My opinion is that CRT is most certainly being taught in schools, but it's not literally being taught in schools. In the same way that when I learned whole language uh, pedagogy, I didn't go into classes and say, hey kids, I have a new way of teaching you. Let me give you insight into how to teach K through 12 kids. What I did is I brought the uh, the tools of of whole language into the classroom with me, which informed the way I taught. So any of you who are defending the concept of CRT not filtering into schools as a result of, of pedag pedagogical influence uh, are either um, willfully naive or intentionally uh, obstruction, obstructionist because you know it's just a matter of time before um, Western hegemonic imperialist white America completely freaks the hell out and shuts this down because they're going to 100% perceive it as uh, vanguardism or uh, Marxist vanguard of the proletariatism or... Um, you know, a reinterpretation of uh, workers unite, workers rise, and cast off the chains of oppression. And you don't have much time. It's going to blow up in everybody's face real soon. And I see why you're doing it. But everybody else can see that you're doing it too. So be careful. Uh, faites attention. And good luck. Hey there, this is Chris Cast, Season 3, Episode 3. My name's Chris Abraham, and this episode is going to be everything I do and don't know about critical race theory. Now, I am a cisgender 51-year-old man. I am uh, white. I am uh, American. And uh, I grew up in Hawaii. But I was still white in Hawaii, and I still had uh, white entitlement in Hawaii. 
even though I was a minority there. So I'm not going to use any of that stuff as excuses. Mostly I'm just going to address everything in terms of my understanding of logic, my understanding the history of critical race theory, and some, uh, some graduate level education I had in the space. So that's it. Uh, politically, all this other stuff I'm not going to talk about. Um, how it's being used, what the intent of it is, or anything else like that. I'm just going to sort of try to explain it from my, uh, you know, I used to be a different person before I became your crazy Uncle Chris. So let's get into it after the break. Welcome back. This is Chris Cast. Uh, my name is Chris Abraham. Uh, this is um, season three, episode uh, three, and I am talking about critical race theory. And it is the only thing that I'm addressing here is that the uh, the media, the news, everybody. I live in Virginia. I don't have kids. Never had kids. Uh, am not a good enough uncle to uh, be close enough to anybody else's kids, all that other kind of thing. So the only education I've ever received was before I was six, I went to preschool in a uh, Jewish preschool in uh, Midtown Manhattan. And when I was six, we moved to Hawaii, and I went to a public school called Aliamanu Elementary, and um, it was in an area called Salt Lake, and um, it was, you know, there were a lot of military kids, because we were close to the airport and relatively close to uh, an Air Force base. And so there were some Howley kids. Howley is uh, Hawaiian for unwelcome visitors, which basically means uh, crackers, Howley's white, local, uh, you know, white people. And uh, loved it. Loved Ali Manu Elementary. Was scared of Ali Manu Intermediate, so I begged my parents to send me to an all-boys Catholic school named St. Louis School for Boys. At that point, it was uh, 7th through 12th grade. Before Now it's uh, K through 12. And before my class, it was 9 through 12. So I believe my class was the first class to have intermediate school kids, middle, middle school kids. So that's my only experience. I loved it. I loved Catholic school. I loved all-boys school. I um, enjoyed the education I got. It was very much reading, writing, arithmetic. There was um, religion class. There was sex education. I feel like I don't have any anything to compare it to except for when I did a school swap uh, as student body president. I did a school swap with Punahou, um, Barack Obama's uh, school, and it was so much better. It was, for example, I, I sat in, in a class that was literature in the context of history. So it was a large classroom with a, uh, a uh, Socratic method. People, the, the students were in a giant circle in, uh, on ch in chairs, and there were two teachers in the class. One was a literature teacher and one was a history teacher, and they taught uh, literature in a his in, and historical context, and it was amazing to me. But I don't want to, you know, I don't want to compare. You know, I went to GW, I went to University of East Anglia, I went to University of Hawaii. I liked uh, everywhere I go. I like the schooling I, I'm in. I've never studied in an Ivy League school or, or Georgetown or Johns Hopkins or anything like that. Um, I've never studied in a uh, junior college either. But uh, what I did study at uh, GW is I studied graduate, I studied American literature 
And as I got closer to the end of my four years, I took some graduate level classes. And the two classes that I took were, were one class on um, Marxist feminist theory, and the other class was African American literary theory. And this was back in 1993, 1992, 1993. And uh, it was all about, it was an academic study, but it was all about um, Marxism, of course. Uh, but in terms of the context of, of the historical goals of Marxism, which is to redefine the narrative of history. And redefining the narrative history is, is to turn the hegemonic narrative of the West on its head. And the way you do that is you uh, deconstruct the narrative. Uh, and and it, obviously the strategy is called deconstructionism. And it was, I guess, was it... Um, was it uh was it from the French school? I think it might have been the French school deconstructionism is from the French school um, sorry about the airplane right outside. I don't know if you can hear it Hey Google. Volume 10. Hey, Google, who wrote There's Nothing Beyond the Text? According to Wikipedia, Jacques Derrida was an Algerian-born French philosopher best known for developing a form of semiotic analysis known as deconstruction, which he analyzed in numerous texts and developed in the context of phenomenology. He is one of the major figures associated with post-structuralism and postmodern philosophy. So, the entire world of critical race theory is based on, on postmodernism. And, uh, hey Google, what is postmodernist theory? On the website Britannica.com, they say, Postmodernism, also spelled postmodernism, in Western philosophy, a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivism, or relativism, a general suspicion of reason, and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. So, this is the uh, blueprints of critical race theory. This is an entirely different way of looking at things. It's post structuralist, it's postmodern. Hey, Google, defined modernism. According to Wikipedia, postmodernism is a broad movement that hey, developed Google, in the mid to late... what is modernism? According to Wikipedia, modernism is both a philosophical movement and an art movement that arose from broad transformations in Western society during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Hey, Google. What is the philosophy of modernism? According to Google Books, this work has been selected by scholars as being culturally important. Hey Google, part of the define the philosophy of modernism. Hey Google, what is modernism the philosophy? On the website courses.lumenlearning.com, they say, Modernism was essentially based on a utopian vision of human life and society and a belief in progress or moving forward. So, the irony is, is that in order to move society forward, there needs to be a collective narrative. And this collective narrative is... Um, is is owned by somebody and unfortunately in the concept of progress and moving things forward uh the the mantle of that in america and in the west has always been on the shoulders of of whiteness uh perceived white power actual white power a concept of of culture as defined by white western europeans um 
all of these things create a narrative that is um, that turns people of color and women into into background characters. And so um, Jacques Derrida and Hélène Sixou and the entire postmodern French movement um, created this world where there's nothing beyond the text. And which is to say, the context of our modern world is, is, is not important. It's only important uh, what is written into a particular artwork, a particular philosophy, that it shouldn't matter who does the creation, who does the narrative, and so forth. That context is dead. But the, also, the, um, it worked with feminism and then into the academy as uh, tools of deconstructionism. And uh, postmodernism and deconstructionism became a movement um, with its real flaw and its most common popular flaw, because everything's a lot more nuanced than this. Its popular flaw is that deconstructionism based on postmodernism is a, de is, a, is a destructive theory that has no real ideas for what to rebuild in, out of the rubble. Um, hey, Google, who wrote the quote, um, I cannot use the master's tools to, uh, build, the, to, um, to build the master's house? Lord, Audrey, on the website projectmyopia.com, they say... Lord, Audrey, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Penguin Modern, 23, Penguin, 2018. So I totally botched the quote, but yeah, the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house. So deconstructionism, along with postmodernism, uh, created linguistic and literary tools, philosophical tools, that can dismantle uh, the master's house. And these tools, this strategy has evolved over time. Like I'm 51 years old and I uh, started learning about deconstructionism uh, in the early 90s and studied uh, Jacques Derrida and Ellen Sixou and Audre Lorde and... Um, and explored uh, the black arts movement and explored um, the... Uh... Hey, Google, who wrote The Signifying Monkey? Henry Louis Gates Jr. wrote The Signifying Monkey. So Henry Gates Jr. wrote an amazing book called The Signifying Monkey. And uh, all these books are, are really important tools with which you can de uh, you can dismantle uh, societal racism, you can dis uh, dismantle societal systemic sexism, racism. Uh, you can dismantle a uh, a white supremacy with them. So to say that critical race theory isn't taught in schools is a, is a uh, is a red herring. Um, the people from my class of academia, although I'm not an academic, but the people from my class of academia and the people after me, since uh, really um, deconstruction. Hey, Google, when did deconstructionism become popular? On the website designingbuildings.co.uk, they say... Deconstructivism developed out of the postmodern style and first gained widespread attention in 1988 with an exhibition entitled Deconstructivist Architecture in New York's Museum of Modern Art. The exhibition featured the work of architects such as Frank Gehry, Rem Koolhaas, and Zaha Hadid. So, I started college in 1988. So, um... It took a little while to get to me because obviously I'm not going to study uh, deconstructionism uh, as an undergrad, really, in a school like GW. But I studied feminist theory and African-American theory, and it was definitely uh, full steam ahead when I was studying those things in uh, 1990, 1992, 1993. And so... 
um, it has matriculated into more and more academic systems. These tools are very powerful, they're very interesting, and they're really a great way to dismantle all the greats, to take down everybody who had hegemonic control over this modernist entitlement, this, 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 um, this movement into a future which is defined by Star Trek and defined by, by um, uh, a future of Western global hegemony, a, a future that is defined by capitalism, uh, by, by um, I guess, by white Christian values, by this idea that Hemingway and James Joyce and, and William Shakespeare are the definition of culture, and culture flows to America from Europe, and in that dominance of the rational, um, scientific-based, uh, even, even if you will, enlightened liberal democracy, all of those things are de facto white supremacist. They haven't quite gotten to the point to say that truth values, uh, what is it called, um, in the American way, that they have yet to completely define the American way of life and the American dream as decidedly uh, white supremacy, but it is right there in front of us. Um, the hegemony of, of, of Western Europe and of the, the United States and of even Canada and the UK is being dismantled as being um, unfair players in a world stage. And in a world stage, um, they are, they're, they're gaming the system and they need to be overthrown. So by the tools of postmodernism, deconstructionism, um, uh, decontextualism, uh, redefining ownership, re redefining control, uh, reading, redefining um, uh, narrative, re reading history, reinterpreting uh, all literature, history, art, and science. Uh, reconsidering heroes and players, uh, re-examining the canon and redefining the canon. When I went to university and studied American literature, it was called Western canon. Western canon is a Western uh, supremacy concept. Western canon is white supremacy. Socrates, Aristotle, um, all the Greeks, uh, philosophers, all the British philosophers, all the American philosophers, all the French philosophers, concepts of masonry, concepts of enlightenment, concepts of the church, concepts of Christianity, all these things are uh, all built into the manifest destiny known as modernism. Now, that needs to be completely deconstructed, and as a result, critical race theory is the tool with which to do that. You do not teach the tool, uh, for example, if I were to say that neurolinguistic programming, NLP, is the tool that I use to, uh, to manipulate people into agreeing with me, or coercing people, or I use a strategy of love bombing or you know any other cultish movement any other cult movement hey google what is neurolinguistic programming hey google what is neurolinguistic programming according to wikipedia neurolinguistic programming is a pseudoscientific approach to communication personal development and psychotherapy created by richard bandler and john grinder in california united states in the 1970s Hey, Google, what is love bombing? According to Wikipedia, love bombing is an attempt to influence a person by demonstrations of attention and affection. It can be used in different ways and for either positive or negative purposes. Psychologists have identified love bombing as a possible part of a cycle of abuse and have warned against it.
So there's any number of strategies that you can use to manipulate people. Uh, you can manipulate them, uh, but but none of these strategies, none. There are no manipulation strategies. There are no hearts and mind strategies that you literally teach someone. You only teach the other people who are going to be using these tools, right? So um, we call this pedagogy, right? Hey, Google, what is the definition of pedagogy? Here's the definition of pedagogy, the method and practice of teaching, especially as an academic subject or theoretical concept. So CRT is a quasi-pedagogical uh, uh, tool. And so when you go into a fifth grade class, you don't teach kids how to teach. You teach kids uh, the curriculum. In the same way, while CRT is not being taught in Virginia schools, the CRT pedagogical framework is being used to teach kids in schools. Um, hey, Google, what is whole language pedagogy? On the website verywellfamily.com, they say, also known as balanced literacy, the whole language approach is an educational philosophy that teaches children to read by using strategies that show how language is a system of parts that work together to create meaning. So that's another pedagogical strategy, right? So all these strategies, you don't bring into the cl classroom and literally teach them. When they say things like, we only teach CRT in, in law schools. It's because law schools, lawyers are being taught to be professionals. They're being taught to be professionals. The question is, is CRT being taught in, in schools of education? Uh, is CRT being taught in, in Harvard uh, School of Education? Is it being taught at Yale School of Education? Is it being taught at GW School of Education? Is it being taught at graduate level courses to get master's degree, uh, master's degrees in education so that you can become a teacher? Are they being taught at uh, Kalamazoo Teachers College? Hey Google, is there a place called Kalamazoo Teachers College? Sure, here's some helpful information I found on the web. Western State Normal School, Western State Teachers College. Okay, now it's called uh, Western Michigan University. But when I taught there in 95, there was still a Kalam Kalamazoo uh, Teachers College. So at teachers colleges, you know, which are two or four year colleges, graduate school or whatever, are they teaching these, these tools, right? So to say uh, we are not teaching CRT to students is, a, is the worst kind of lie, and it's really easy to see through. The question is, are you using CRT strategies to redefine, uh, to, in other words, deconstruct a Western hegemony, a Western, um, a Western supremacy concept of the history of America, the history of literature as being a, a complete facade where um, a, uh, a, a white supremacist system put in place a suppression against minority voices. And in truth, the history of America, the history of literature, the history of voices, the history of women, the history of black Americans, the history of Asian Americans, and so forth, have been single-handedly suppressed, a way of existing, a way of, uh, 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 out of existence, um, in order to um, prop up a false narrative of Western imperialism, uh, Western control, and Western superiority, as defined by the West, the Western white cisgender male. Now, that sounds to me like what the very definition of Black Lives Matter attempts to do. Black Lives Matter is, uh, by definition, a, uh, founded by a trained Marxist. I don't know why we need to hide these things. I studied 
feminist theory in a context of uh, Marxist uh, feminist theory. I know that in the world of, of literary theory, academia, education, historical perspective, and so forth, I mean, Karl Marx was an amazing historian, an amazing uh, sat uh, satirialist. He was a f an amazing writer. But I do know that uh, historically, from the very beginning, community organization is by its very nature a, um, a, a, an extremely progressive, sometimes socialistic, and, 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 and oftentimes Marxist uh, method of, of, of hearts and minds. I mean, it is the number one, number two, number three strategy of the vanguard of the proletariat. Hey Google, what is the vanguard of the Hey Google? What is the vanguard of the proletariat? According to Wikipedia, in the context of the theory of Leninist revolutionary struggle, vanguardism involves a strategy whereby the most class conscious and politically advanced sections of the proletariat or working class, described as the revolutionary vanguard, form organizations in order to draw larger sections of the working class. There you go. I mean, it might not be based on working class now. It might be based on, on gender. It might be based on race. Uh, but it is, um, there is extreme, there are extreme amounts of vanguarding going on at the moment. Um, and, you know, that is, and, and, you know, conveying this new world, I guess, uh, Things have moved on since 1993. Back in the day, one would say that deconstructionism doesn't have a strategy for rebuilding, but I dare say that build back better is the definition of rebuilding uh, the deconstruction and, and dismantling, not using the master's tools, using maybe the Marxist tools, using the Marxist tools to dismantle, dismantle the ma master's house <coughs> in an Audre Lordian sort of way, and then rebuilding it with a build back better globalist strategy. And um, uh, I guess in many ways, even though, you know, COP whatever is, and, and Davos and everything else, don't forget guys, that, that this entire strategy might be being used. I mean, I still see all white dudes. I still see uh, kleptocrats, I still see monarchs, I still see oligarchs, I still see rich white men from Europe and from the West uh, defining what the future of Build Back Better is going to be. Old white men still define what Build Back Better is defined as. So um, it's important to see, you know, where you borrowed your tools and who really is the tool master behind the tools. But in order, if, if you go ahead and abashedly say, you know, like, um, uh, wasn't me, we're not teaching CRT, wasn't me. We're not teaching it in the schools, no, wasn't me. We're not teaching it to kids in curriculum, wasn't me. We're only teaching it in law schools, wasn't me. Then you know for a fact that it's not authentic, that you're not being truthful, and that there's a lot of lying going on. I mean, I hate hypocrisy. I think once my my sus, if you will, spidey s stuff comes up, I just did one yesterday on, on Kyle Rittenhouse and the gun stuff. I just feel like I need to address this kind of thing. And I think it's really being inauthentic. And since this is so long, I'm going to go ahead and, and do a TLDR at the beginning of this podcast and sort of just give away the beans um, but uh, anyway, I'm done now. I, I think I've run out of steam. I'll be back to let you know how you can contact me. And uh, we'll talk in a second. <laughs> Hey there, Chris Abraham here. Chris Cast, Season 3, Episode 3. Uh, 33 is a magic number. Um, you can reach me at chrisabraham.com. 
you can email me at chris at abraham.su. You can find me on Twitter at Chris Abraham, Instagram at Chris Abraham. I think Christopher Abraham on TikTok. Uh, I'm on uh, Snapchat. I'm on Telegram. I'm on Signal. I'm on WhatsApp. You can find those if you need my phone number at plus one two zero two three five two five zero five one. You can text me at that. But if you call me, I won't answer. If you want to schedule a call, I'm at uh, calendly dot com slash chris abraham slash fifteen. Uh, if you want um, to email me, like I said, chris at abraham dot com. On No Agenda Social, I'm chris at noagendasocial.com and uh, that might be it I'm also on YouTube uh, at Chris Abraham youtube.com slash Chris Abraham and uh, I've got this podcast Chris Cast uh, based on anchor.fm slash Chris Abraham but I'm everywhere and I could really use your help please give me stars uh, write reviews you can do it on Apple Podcasts. You can do it on Stitcher, on iHeartRadio. You can do it on your. You can do it on Spotify. You can do it on Anchor. You can also do it on your app. I know that Podcast Addict, Podcast Addict, has a place where you can review and share. Um, all the other ones do, I'm sure. And I would be much obliged. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Mahalo.